Welcome back to AP Taylor Swift. This week we are doing a deep dive of love story. But first, some quick class announcements. If you are enjoying this podcast, please do us a favor, rate us, review us on Spotify, on Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, this not only feels good to get some positive feedback, but it also helps other people discover the podcast. So if you're liking this, there's probably other people like you, Swifties, dear readers, dear listeners who might like this podcast. So rate us, give us a good rating, give us some feedback, a good, nice review. Um, we really appreciate it and future listeners appreciate it as well. The other thing to mention is that if you're listening on Spotify, they have this great Q&A and polls feature. So we have some Q&A and some questions in there on different episodes. So you can engage with us and you can engage and see what your fellow listeners are thinking about. So I think on our first episode, which we called Songs That Made Us Swifties, the question is what song made you a Swifty with the class uh, and engage with other listeners like yourself. So with that, we've got a deep dive today. Jen, why don't you ground us in the rhetorical triangle and how we do our deep dives? Yes. So the way we really look at it is who's the speaker, who are they speaking to, and what is the purpose? Um, so we'll wrap it up at the end, kind of what do we think the purpose of this song is? And something I think for this one in particular, this is a very narrative song. We are very much telling a story compared to some other songs that are really exploring a moment or a feeling. Um, so I think in figuring out who is the speaker, we also need to be thinking about a little bit what is the setting? What is setting the scene, setting the stage for this. Um, so I would suggest maybe we just kind of kick it off right at the beginning. We were both young when I first saw you. It's a, it's a once upon a time kind of moment there. So how is that, how's that setting the stage and tell, what is it telling us about um, the speaker and who they are speaking to? love the once upon a time because this is such a fairy tale kind of a song. It definitely has like a beginning, middle and an end. There's kind of, there's definitely like a climax and a resolution kind of follows all of the typical storytelling frameworks there's a prince uh, and, and a princess at some point yeah which, very storytelling uh and and a lot of references to very well-known stories as well uh shakespeare being one of the most obvious which we discussed last week oh yeah i forgot to mention that this is a continuation of our conversation last week on shakespeare there are some things that we talked about there like we related the yeah. song to romeo and juliet so if you're like wait a second you missed this hot take hot, uh, well we can discuss that <laughs> you're right but last week last week we related this song to romeo and juliet if you haven't listened to that go back listen and then come back anyway sorry i should have said that up front my bad. Yeah. I like the once upon a time comparison. We were both young when I first saw you. We don't have a sense of how much time passes throughout this song, but I do think that there's several hints that time has passed throughout. Uh, I mean, I close my eyes and the flashback starts. So yeah. this whole story is being yeah. told in retrospect. Someone's looking back on the experience. Interesting. I forgot about that part. Yeah. I think of like the Titanic where like the old lady, oh, like, is it that good long? comparison? Like, no, that's a great comparison. Like, or is we, like we the really notebook as well. The, the notebook is also all told in flashback. Yeah. But that's the thing is like, we really have no idea how long it's been. Uh, it could be five years. It could be two years. It could be 20 years. And so that's interesting. It is all in first person. There is a you, which is Romeo, but it's very like, I, me, Juliet you Romeo and Those we talked about this. me Tarzan you Jane and we talked about this a little bit in the last episode but it does feel like the Romeo and Juliet is a metaphor they're not literally Romeo and Juliet she's not literally telling the story she's saying uh, she's she's allowing us to skip through a lot of the details of the it's relationship or, or it's like a retelling right like that was the other option is like a retelling of Romeo and Juliet with a different ending yeah but it, I think I think in the metaphor it gives you that leeway to say like there's other stuff here but just know that this love is love was yeah. on that level it's like that right. level of escalation and it's a good if we think about this song in the context of her catalog so this is on her second album fearless so she was still fairly unknown and this song really kind of catapulted her forward and it's a really smart song to use as 
your first single on your sophomore album because Romeo and Juliet is a very relatable story. It provides a lot of context and kind of tells you what you need to know or feel going into it. If she had, if those words weren't in here, we might not have known the magnitude or the feelings behind this song. And she does something similar with the fact that Tim McGraw is her very first single where she's using something relatable I, I, I was just gonna say to I don't audience. know. If re- I don't know. If relatable is the word. Something I was like, people know. Something people like, know. It's like you lost me at Romeo. Awareness. And Sorry, she's using something that people have an awareness of. <laughs> yes. So yeah. that she doesn't yeah. have to familiar. Relatable. She doesn't have to waste time explaining this is a Exposition. great love. She she's can just not... say you were Romeo. Yeah. I was Juliet. Everyone's like, Done. great. Got it. I understand where we're at. When you yeah. I think Taylor does this all the time where she puts herself in conversation with the greats. Like she's like, yeah. I'm not just anybody. Like I'm talking about, I'm Shakespeare. Like I'm, I'm yeah. putting myself in conversation with him. Uh, and you're right. Like as somebody who is just new, like dropping names, like Tim McGraw or Romeo, Romeo Juliet, and Juliet. Like, good so ways think, to grab people's attention. I think something we definitely have Taylor as the author, but I think something with this song in particular, it is not a, a true story from taylor's life we're pretty right. certain of that which means it's really really fun to analyze what i mean we don't ever get into the gossip but we can like taylor was a great writer but when we're analyzing shakespeare we're not like well what did he think what did he do we're talking about the characters and this is one of the most narrative songs where we really get that especially early we get it more on folklore and evermore but this is really an early version of her doing yeah. this because she says so we can even just without any other context we were both young when i first saw you i closed my eyes and the flashback starts so there's a speaker it's juliet talking to romeo quote unquote it's the metaphor she's using but the whole context of this is based on those first two lines it is someone repeating the love story to their partner which is kind of cool it almost makes me like are these like wedding vows like where it's the notebook yeah um but so within the context of that story then we have this sort of frame of the narrative of it's it's we know from the beginning that they're somehow still talking to each other and that's which is interesting I, that's why i wanted to stress that we don't know how long it's been and that especially because taylor was quite young when she wrote this you take that out of the context like these characters can be any which age it could be at any point in time we don't really have a, a sense of who they are other than the fact that they're talking to each other mm-hmm. and they're they're reflecting well and then if we move forward in the narrative it's it's the moment they meet it's the meet cute i'm standing there on a balcony in summer air see the lights see the party the ball gowns the see enchanted you make- vibes enchanted. the enchanted vibes are strong with this one which if we go back I to toss enchanted, it up and you hit it right out of the black <laughs> boom teamwork which when we were doing Enchanted, we were thinking about how it reminded us of Pride and Prejudice. Pride and, Prejudice. and mm-hmm. here also you have lights, party, ball gowns. I mean, I think of I think of Pride and Prejudice. I also think of like Cinderella. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a very fairy tale. Very fairy tale. Fairy coded. tale. Yes. Exactly. And uh, like, Romeo you and ever- Juliet was-, <clears throat> was 14th century Italy and ball gowns like not really what we not think of. Not really a thing. But also would you ever consider Romeo and Juliet a fairy tale? Like, do you, do you think of no. when you think, right? So it's an interesting way to bring things together. This fairy tale vibes, my least favorite word. Um, she says, <laughs> Prin- you'll be the prince and I'll be the princess. But with yeah. Romeo and Juliet. So that was wishing- the line. It's a mashup. That yeah, was the line they're, that they're I was going to say. Yeah. Prince and, and princess is, fairy is fairy tale. Yeah. But this is a fairy tale in a sense. It's a love story. But Romeo and the Juliet was is, not. Yes. Yeah, and and I think this is where it's like, it's not just, Romeo and Juliet is the main literary reference when it comes to them, the speakers. The speakers are being compared to Romeo and Juliet because their love story was on the same level of epicness, maybe. But there is more there. There's other stories too. And I think what I'm really getting is that the speakers are like the two protagonists of any story. They are the two main characters of any major love story Mm -hmm. ever. Uh, and that's why the name of the song is also love story. It's not fairy tale or it's, it's not, not Romeo, Romeo and Juliet. Juliet. Yeah, it's yeah. fair. Well, and it's to me too, I think because we cement it very early that this is one partner speaking to the other, that it's kind of saying our story is the love story. We can the reference all of yeah. these other things, but what we have, it reminds me, I bring up how I met your mother all the time. And again, I know not all the age well, but it has some good moments where 
there's the whole show is obviously Ted telling his kids how he met their mother. And it's like supposed to be the greatest love story of all time. Um, and there's a moment where he meets someone else, thinks that they like might have a match, but she ends up like reconnecting with an old flame. And he says like, that was the second best love story I've ever heard, but he still maintains his love story is the best love story. I think agree or disagree with what Ted is saying in that moment in the show. I think that's sort of, to me is what we're kind of getting here of like, Hey, you and me, we have the best love story. Maybe it is objectively the best love story, or maybe it's just because it's theirs, you know? I And I think people who have found a great love, like Taylor sings about great love a lot, like as a concept. And I think it's like when you find a great love, it's like you do think that. Like you always, people yeah. have that personal connection. You're There's like, yeah. ours is the greatest love story this ever told. Um, yeah. All and- cats are incredible. My cats are the best cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And and then the story and and, and, the, and the the song is written like a story. I I did hear that. I'm gonna ignore it. And, uh, <laughs> She's like going right past that. <laughs> and it, like the song is written like an actual story. So you're now getting into the structure. Like we have the opening, um, mm-hmm. and then we we get into the the flashback. So we're, we met at a ball. There were. The, you're making your way through the crowd that's like such a darcy moment i think um but this is not a darcy moment hello uh say hello little did i know you were romeo i think it's like this idea of we met we had a conversation and at that time that was just the beginning we had nowhere or no idea of where this was gonna go that this was yeah. forbidden and then the little did i know that you were romeo so little yeah. did i know that this was not a love that was accessible to me this is forbidden my daddy said stay away from Juliet so like we get the romantic vibes and it's like hold up do not enter do not pass go like this is not allowed and that's what yeah. using Romeo and Juliet lets us do is we get the sense that they are star-crossed faded lovers that were not allowed to be together I also got the sense from this is that you were Romeo that like you were the one like I didn't yeah, know faded. Then yeah. that you were the one. It's only the and my daddy said stay away from Juliet that we get the the second level yeah. of this person being Romeo. Yeah. yeah, we have you know narratively we have hey I'm going to tell you our story we met and then immediately conflict happened. <laughs> my daddy said stay away Juliet. We're crying real fast in this love story. Um. And again, that's the second level of kind of being Romeo and Juliet. And then again, like passage of time is unclear here because yeah. she says like little do we know. I love the way that she did this. Like she was such a young writer and the fact that she can like jump through it all. It really does feel like a memory reel where you're like yeah. jumping through a ton of moments quickly. Even, yeah. I was crying, begging you, here are all the things. So I sneak out to the garden to see you. Like you see time move. You see the action that she's taking. Well, in the garden of- too is really important. Well, one, we talked about cruel summer in the last episode. I snuck through the garden gate garden every gate. night that summer just to seal my fate. Yeah. Um, but also if you just kind of go back really historically, we always just bring up Pride and Prejudice, but you'll get this, you'll get this in almost any other story from the time. Um the public sphere. Yes, but it's it's a public sphere. It's a place uh, where you can go that's like out of your house. You're not you're not under the eyes of your parents or whoever is your guardian at the moment. A garden is kind of this like often this very metaphorical and literal like safe space for forbidden lovers right. or you know whatever to kind of meet outside your home. So it's not as intimate and as forbidden as being in your home, but it's still. Yes you're still together when you shouldn't be. I mean, she says, take me somewhere we can be alone. And I think there was a time, but there's also an age, if you think of just like youth, where there's like not many places you can really go (laughs) to be alone. Your car is like the only thing. Also, the car the oldest Monty has ever sounded is when she said youth. (laughs) There's a time (laughs) in like youth, I guess. I'm, um, I have... (laughs) I've been with my husband since we were 16. I had like yeah. a real flashback to like when we were 15 years old, we couldn't go know? anywhere you to, to be you alone. You went to the car. Yeah. yeah, you had the car. And that was about it. <laughs> Stop signs. <laughs> so, uh, so I sneak out to the car to see you. Yeah, it's just like the modern day garden. Who has a garden? Uh, Everyone has a car. Everyone has a car. The no parking lot. <laughs> That's literally what it is. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, you sneak out to a party. Yeah, you get to the car, you go to a 
the parking lot anyway. Yeah. And we keep quiet because we're dead if they knew. Yeah, I was also thinking it was just like like girls back in the day always needed a chaperone. You always needed like parental mm-hmm. uh, supervision, which actually gets us down to this other part that I'm super interested in. Escape this town. Like she wants to get away, go somewhere alone. She really wants this like privacy, escape this town for a little while, get away from the chatter. I think whenever we hear the word town used in some of these songs, it doesn't always just mean town. It means town's people. It means mm-hmm. gossip. It comes with the whole baggage of a small community. Um, but then it says, you were Romeo. I was a scarlet letter. Okay. I'm, I'm so excited Let's for us go. to dig into this because it go is ahead, a Jen. hell of a reference. You Correct. talk about Romeo and Juliet tragedy. We talk about prince and princess. Okay. Sort of get that love story. And then there's scarlet letter, which is just a loaded reference to loaded. make. We have Nathaniel Hawthorne writing the scarlet letter. And it is about an unmarried woman who gets pregnant and shunned by the whole town if you haven't read it that's pretty much the i haven't it. either but i saw easy a which is as close as i got yeah I easy, got honestly pocket, easy a gets you pretty, pretty darn close to it but yeah. and then she has to wear a literally a scarlet a scarlet for adulterer um is she single or is her husband just disappeared i can't remember either way I don't she think- clearly is not she her she is not pregnant by a husband that is clear um and so she ignominy is, re- is the one word I remember from this book. The number of times it came up. Ignominy, ignominy, ignominy. <laughs> what does it mean? What, this is our word of the day? I, I can pull okay, up the I'll definition, it up. but I think it means extreme shame. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's a very deserving or causing public, public disgrace shame or shame. Or disgrace. Yeah. So she has the baby. It's Hester Prynne. Wow, this is, I'm actually really proud of myself. Have not read this recently, but I'm still remembering this. So her name's Hester Prynne. She has the baby. She has to stand holding her baby for several hours in the town square with a scarlet A on her. Like that's her big punishment. I guess I should have um, figured that we'd go into this in because it literally ignominy. says scarlet letter. Scarlet letter. In this- song yeah. but here i am I'm like how did we get here we got here because taylor brought us here so scarlet letter is saying she was a scarlet letter is like she's i shamed. think in this context it's supposed to be she's like forbidden she's shamed she's she an outcast forbidden. yeah which is fascinating because also it's really interesting so she is uh impregnated by the pastor or whatever he and is he's of the not town. shamed he does she no, she not. never reveals it she keeps the secret girl because I think they do there is a strong like they do actually seem to love each other that she's just saying like I we do actually love each other she can't hide it she's pregnant so there's nothing this she book can would do frustrate me it but is she a does very keep frustrating book it's very frustrating it's also, very it's written by a dude so yeah yeah Shocking. but it is it is interesting because they do seem they have there's this moment talking about the garden oh gosh someone out there's read this more recently i'm sorry if i get these details wrong but there is this whole chapter where hester and whatever his name is i don't know some dude so they go out into the woods and they have like this very sweet like intimate moment so talking about the garden again there is this like getting away from town getting away from society and getting into nature and they can kind of be together and it is frustrating but i think it's it's supposed to be you don't leave that book which like it's, this is kind of radical you don't was, leave the it, book thinking H- hester's the bad person you hate well, the town it's, it's written in puritan massachusetts i want to say yes, uh, I think yeah so. so so it's also like grounding ourselves that it's a commentary on like this extremely conservative society yes. so yes it is you kind of like want her to do more but at the same time again We've talked about this in other stories. If you want to say something even remotely radical, you need to make sure your character who's saying that is not the villain. And so by keeping his secret, by being genuinely in love, like that does add, she's not that you don't. Buys her some brownie points. Yeah, you don't hate her. You actually, you really pity her. The the townspeople are definitely the villains. And it, actually, the story ends up that way, where at the end, people really respect her. Like, the town comes to forgive her. And, like, that A that used to be shame is kind of a mark of pride of, like, she's she's held up under the scrutiny. She's held up, and she's stayed true, and she's a good mother, and she... Like they kind of come around in the book. And so it, it is certainly a lesson about getting away from town. And like, what does that mean to have those expectations? It is. It's a hell of a reference for Taylor to be making in this song. one um, <gasps> note of clarification. So she is married, but her husband was supposed to be lost at sea and hadn't That's been right. found for like a long time. And then she like, apparently he comes back at some point yeah. where she recognizes him. That's, I was like, but I feel like her he was missing comes in action. So back, he wasn't but, available. Yes. For um, her to be pregnant, it was clear. It was not done in the married 
situation for her. Yes, in yeah. wedlock. Yeah. Um, um, anyways, so it's, a, it's a Taylor Swift to love story. So for her to say, "I was a scarlet letter," it's like she's also trying to get away from the town, escape mm-hmm. the town for a little while. So there is some goss happening about her, right. or there are some we- rumors in the rumor mill. Or maybe they're not just rumors. Maybe that's like actual ignominy of hers. Like well, she's then, got. I mean, Hester was pregnant out of wedlock. Like that. That was an accurate thing. It's just they were jerks about it. Well, and we get a right bit after of a... they met in the garden we, secretly. So we it's get a like... bit of a sense of what's happening. <laughs> Romeo, save me! They're trying to tell me how to feel. This love is difficult, but it's real. Don't be afraid. We'll make it out of this mess. It's a love story, baby. Just say yes. So she changes the chorus slightly. And so the reason she wants to be alone and run away is they're trying to tell me, they're trying to influence how I feel and about the romance. So I get a sense of, it goes back to, you know, Romeo and Juliet coming from warring families that they're trying to say, no, you should hate this person which doesn't relate to why Juliet would be the Scarlet Letter. <laughs> I am seeing the song in a whole new light because this often happens when we do this, but <laughs> she just said, okay, let's just sequence of events really fast. So they sneak out to the garden. We have to keep quiet because we'll, we're dead if they knew. Okay, oh, so geez. something is going on oh, in this are garden. They like, are they like, you know... Having some, I think, I think, I think we're doing okay. happened in this garden. A clip of that dead. is going to be on Instagram. The world needs to see what Jody just did there. She just, <laughs> just took her two fists and just kind of like put like them together. Boots? Are we knocking boots here? And then, because keep quiet, because we're dead if they knew. So I think close I broke your eyes, Jen. guys. Wait, we're listening. We're listening. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Close your eyes. Escape this town. Okay. She's got to go. They did something bad. Okay, we, but no, but like, why does it feel knew. so good? <laughs> okay. We're focusing. We're focusing. We're mature We'd be dead adults. if they knew. Okay. Okay. A and very intense statement. Okay, but um, close your eyes. Escape the town for a little while. Then we get the Scarlet Letter reference. Is uh, a little while nine months, perhaps? Is how long she wants to escape? maybe what's crazy though is right after it like goes back into the chorus it says daddy says stay away from juliet you were everything to me there's a line here that says it's a line in the chorus which we all have screamed a million times it says all that's left to do is run like all there's left to do is run there is nothing else we have to run there's no other option so this is You'll a teenage the pregnancy friend. song is what you're saying that's <laughs> just i'm getting I... new meaning from it's a love story baby like who's the baby <laughs> just... the swift horse is gonna hate us for this interpretation this is okay, might be our most controversial like this talk me out of it both... change my mind well i you know the use of Scarlet Letter really says yeah. something because it says that she has something to be shamed about, that she is the reason that people are. And very specifically, sh- there's something the town will shame her about. We're not saying she, ha- she, we're not saying we think she has something to be ashamed of, but we're right. saying the town has labeled her as someone who should have shame. And this whole song is from her perspective. The only time we hear Romeo's voice is at the end. So this is all her. I also like, I think Begging in the music you, video. Please don't go. I feel like in the music video, there was like a Rapunzel moment where she's almost like locked in a tower. I don't know if she was actually right. locked stay in a tower. Stay away from but Juliet. Yeah, the stay away from Juliet is really like, you're a scarlet letter. You want to get away from the town. But like, she's she's hidden away. He's like, not she's the being... bad one. She is. Well, she is, yeah. Or like her dad has her locked up somewhere right. for some reason. Yeah, we're not to sure why. Her. Like I initially thought it was to protect her. I like, initially classic thought it was Romeo and Juliet. I, I initially thought it was to protect her too, but now I'm like, no. I think it's because she's like become the talk of the town. Like maybe she's grounded. Like she's done something bad. Why does it feel so good? Anyway, sorry, <laughs> I can't not. <laughs> yeah, I can't not. Okay, she's so she did something. Up. She's locked up. Scarlet Letter. She's begging him, please don't go. And she got tired of waiting. Like, we're six months in. It's bridge. like, dude. We're at the bridge. It's six months before. Are we saying that she's entering the third trimester? Mom, oh, that my is that God. What we're saying? Okay. I'm tired of <laughs> wondering if you were ever coming around. Is this baby ever going to pop I mean, out? I got I tired be... of waiting. 
<laughs> Wondering I'm if saying, you're saying, I'm just saying it works. I'm saying if a student submitted this with this evidence, yeah. I'd be like, I, you have I a compelling you. argument. Who's, who are the speakers? Is she talking <laughs> to Romeo or is she talking to the baby? We were both young when I first saw you. The baby's young. <laughs> she was maybe young. Wow. Dude. Except there's a marry me. So I'm going to strike that. No, Romeo, but Whoa, he, hold on. He, he, he needs Whoa. to be. Wait, hold on. If we talk about the perspective here, let's talk about this. <laughs> Romeo, save me. I've been feeling so alone. I keep waiting for you. She's talking to Romeo, though. And then she goes, he knelt to the he ground and pulled out a ring. It's not you knelt to the ground. It's a he knelt to the ground. Monty and I were on the exact same page in that moment. <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea where you were going. No, we we knew. We knew. <laughs> We're looking at the lyrics and we're like, wait a second, that's third person. That is third person. Look oh at you guys. Oh my god. Do you think Taylor realizes she switched the pronouns? He knelt to the ground and pulled out a ring. Oh man. That is interesting that so that changes. Well, that makes no sense though, because she's talking to you, Romeo, and then he, Romeo. Y'all. Are they, but okay. did she name the kid Romeo after the dad? <laughs> oh, we are, we are spinning uh, off the rails. Okay, let's get back to the lyrics. The lyrics <laughs> say, um, wondering if you were ever coming around. She's waiting. My faith in you is fading. Faith in you and fading is like, she's, I still feel like she's waiting on the love, maybe. Met you on the outskirts of town, Yeah, obviously. when did they leave? Yeah. Like, why did she run away? Like, she ran away at some point, like, she went she or wanted how did to run she get out? but yeah. she did, ran without him did she run away or did he run away because i was begging you please don't go yeah i well, met you I, on the outskirts of town so she's there is he too. coming back but There's is he both. coming back no. in are they meeting in the middle but she was locked i mean i got the sense oh, that she's, she's still- like locked up somewhere or whatever and she's she's just it, it sounds very passive she's wondering if you were ever coming around like she's waiting for him to come around but then right when her faith was fading, she runs into him somewhere on the outskirts of town. So she does get out. She is somewhere outside of town. And Romeo then just happens to me. run into him. I've been feeling so alone. I keep waiting for you, but you never come. Is this in my head? I don't know what to think. Let's just do that before we... No, before we get to... No, let's pause. Pause on the line. Because let's just think about those lines separately. Like... Okay. I want you to save me because I have nobody, but also like, I'm waiting for you and you're not coming. Like, do we really love each other? Do you love me or am I making this whole thing up? Because I feel a little crazy right now and alone. So she's like, and I think that I is get sad. The, I, I get the impression that this meeting on the outskirts of town is like happenstance. This was not him. He didn't come for her. She went out and ran into him somewhere. Okay. So if that is the case, then he just... He wasn't expecting it, and he's, like, going to save his butt by kneeling to the ground and pulling out a ring and saying, marry me? Like, what? So, I always envisioned this part of the song. I've always imagined the 2006, I think, version of Pride and Prejudice when Darcy and Elizabeth meet at the end in the field where she's just, like, going for a walk, yes, and he's coming to her house. But they yeah. meet on the outskirts, and he basically proposes. So that's always visually, like, that kind of moment I is what I have feels. Here. That feels like what it is. And I think in the music video, it's also kind of something similar in a field where maybe she's finally getting out and getting away, but just happens to cross paths with him as he was actually. He's like, oh, by the way, in my pocket, I have a ring. I think the implication is, is he was coming for her, but like found her as she was leaving. As she was losing hope, as she was. Like she was was going to her house, but yeah, they crossed paths as she was trying to leave. Yeah. Um, the, is this in my head? I don't know what to think is interesting because mm-hmm. I also don't know what to think. And then, okay. It, so then <laughs> it feels yeah, very God. still kind of, we talk about fairy tale. It does kind of feel very period romance. Again, talk about all of these, like Jane Eyre, yeah. all of these other very, fa- anything by Jane Austen, Emma, all of those things where it's kind of this, like, there's there's all of these like feelings and like looks and all of these like well what did that mean or when they said that what does that mean and this is the re- the moment of the request for like what do you want me like can you like confirm what are we doing here yeah define like, the relation dtr let's D- define D- the relationship D-T-R. and he says <laughs> and he's like marry me let's get married <laughs> yes, but this is interesting this is the tense change because here we go the whole song she's been talking in second person 
And then all of a sudden, it's like either she like turns to the camera and is like, <laughs> he nails to the ground and pulls out a ring, guys. Or <laughs> there's or she a messed up person. Or the person she's <laughs> singing to isn't the person who knelt to the ground and pulled out the ring. It's also like if the it's less exciting. It's you knelt to the ground and pulled out a ring. Like you're retelling I mean, it. it it could have somebody worked. who knows what happens like that part is not as exciting it's much more exciting to like go tell your friends he knelt to the ground he pulled out a ring right like I, yeah it, it's like a zooming out yeah. yeah i kind of one of the things i said in the beginning of this conversation that i think does still fit is the idea that this is like their wedding and she's recounting their story to him as part of the vows and this is the moment where it's like it's like that cheeky moment where she looks to the audience and says he knelt to the ground and pulled out a ring of like recounting the love the story but being like but yeah. yeah, but kind of like looking to the to the people also at the ceremony and being like, oh, you know what comes next because yeah, he we're it. here. We're also, at the altar. Like, also thinking practically, because this is the only part where Romeo speaks, Romeo is now talking in second person. Right. And I think it would be confusing to say, you knelt to the ground, pulled out a ring, said, marry me, Juliet, you'll never ever right. have to be alone. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. So I think it was more done for the convenience of the storytelling I don't think and, it changes who she's and talking the to. Also, I think the impact. Hey, but death it of lets the us author. go on a. It does not yes. matter what she intended. It's ours now. If we can make the argument and it's there, we can do it. <laughs> Thanks for giving this to us, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, um, we're free. I mean, I definitely feel like we're missing something there with this Scarlet Letter. I haven't quite like. Un- I don't know. Part of that, me but... feels like again, if I take, I'm gonna get away, do away with death of the author because maybe I don't subscribe to that theory. Um, this was written when she was young, right? She was 14, okay, 15 you, you don't years. subscribe to that theory, but you take every love story and make it not about love. So That's uh... true. I haven't made this one about her career yet. So we're good. <laughs> I think when I think of like, these are Scarlet Letter, Romeo and Juliet are books you read when you're at this age and they are relatable. And so I think it goes back to this, like, what are you familiar they're, with? They're also forbidden romance. They're very different types of romance, but they are both, they're both forbidden, two people yeah. who have moments of love and passion that they're not supposed to have. Yeah. I also, but like, there is like, you'll never have to be alone is like also an interesting line. It's okay line. to like, be alone. Well, it's the <laughs> idea that that would have been the alternative. Like, right, why is exactly. it that if she had, if he hadn't married her, why would she be alone? You know, like going I, along with the yeah. Scarlet Otter theory for five seconds. I, it's just like it's one of those like it feels like she was giving up hope having to go away for herself or like going through something really major like on her own i mean and, she and, stands on that platform <clears throat> alone in the middle of town she's right. really a baby but. and i think like again like yeah like if you have a kid and you're like shunned from the town you're not going to be accepted like you have a child and you're like making peace yes, with the fact lot. that you're like i'm gonna have to re- raise this kid alone um right I don't think I think it holds more gravity than if she just simply like was in love with a guy and he didn't show up because she could like go find another guy like why why is that why is that sending her to a fate of loneliness but he the way that it says like marry me you'll never have to be alone um I don't know I feel like it's a little dramatic we're not at the center of every woman's universe get over yourself well the thing is is the two stories we referenced they don't end up together. That's not that's not the ending of the story. Um, so I but think they also that's... wouldn't have ended up alone. I think Hester kind of does end up. Hester, I mean, she has, Hester she has her kid, but, but that's Romeo what I'm saying. The difference is, is she has a kid. Yeah, but I'm like, if if one of them had died, like, what happens in Angela? Yeah. So Romeo takes the poison mm-hmm. to make it look like he's dead. Juliet comes in, and in Shakespeare, she kills herself. But in Anne Juliet, she doesn't. She's like, oh, that's not good. That's, but then she's like, and wait a second. And does she find another guy? She has a whole life of her own because she's exactly. an independent woman. I she, think she does find another guy, but it's like but it's, on it's her not own like terms. She has, and... It's not like she has to be alone. No, but it's a feminist retelling but Hester, using pop But Hester music, Prynne, so. like, Hester Prynne had to be alone. But she had a kid. Product of their times. I think that's what we're getting at is like the, this – Hester Prynne, Romeo and Juliet, product of their times. Well, I guess what, what I'm saying time is, is period like, is Taylor writing about? Because that would tell I, us. Well, what I, I mean, was saying is, a ball. so what I was saying is, is that like the fact that the alternative was that she might have to be alone is that there might be a kid hidden in here somewhere that is just like unwritten. <laughs> I cannot it's wait. Basically, for the what listener I am feedback on this saying. episode. I'm so excited <laughs> to hear how it's... people we upset. 
but also how many people had their minds blown by the fact I'm that 15, saying 15 year old Taylor right is writing about a kid from pregnancy. But there's I no mean, wrong, yeah, there's no wrong answer. Well, there are wrong answers, but we haven't but it's, heard why yeah. it's wrong. It's not wrong yet. Yeah, it's. I mean, the only. I mean, th- he does tell her to go pick out a white dress. Purity, which is like really, if we go with your theory, that's the purpose. But like, also You're like for pure. the, but for the purposes of the song, like if he was like, yeah. go pick out a beige dress, like that doesn't <laughs> tell us what's happening. Like we're obviously trying to say they're getting married. Um, go pick out your invitations. Yes, <laughs> yes, you get the. Like, go create your guest list, but you can only have pick out a wedding cake. <laughs> don't have make your the not account. <laughs> <laughs> so don't save the dates yeah i guess yeah. So so white dress from an imagery the perspective a white version dress tells of, you everything yeah you need to know yeah. i talk to your dad means he got permission yeah it, i think the whole yeah. this is it's a very old-fashioned proper framing of love setting something right setting Doing something the right, right we were young when we met it was forbidden we couldn't be together and then, you know what? There was you, some drama. There was some drama, but then you made it right by is. talking to my father and getting yeah. permission. And we have a white dress. And that's why this is a love story and not a tragedy. So it's a very old-fashioned love story. And it'd be really interesting to do a comparison to one of her more modern songs. Because I think that we'd get a different perspective. It's the epitome of romanticizing, yes. though, the ideal prince love and story. you'll be the prince and I'll be the princess, Fair, right? When someone thinks about their love. wedding day, fairy tale love, exactly. So it's we're getting into the purpose, but well, I think there's also a very like delusional reading of this because there was also an element. Like, you mean you what think- we did wasn't delusional? Anyway, no, because there's evidence in the. But- I'm kidding. I'm just I like poking the bear. <laughs> no, it's it, this is a totally different take but we're talking about like hey the town says this is inappropriate and then it's going to be resolved by marriage also reminds me of lydia from pride and prejudice Mm. so it could be from that point of view (gasps) this is a very very delusional like oh we're in love we had the most fairy tale love story ever but the story is like what if you replace romeo the word (laughs) romeo with wickham i mean we we, somewhere we can be (laughs) alone Well, we we talked about this briefly in the Shakespeare episode, but it's like, I think there's multiple interpretations that you could have when she says you were Romeo. I think we're yeah. taking the most positive euphemism version tale, of that, which is you're the fated love, you're the one, you're the star-crossed forbidden love. The other interpretation is like literal Romeo, like you're that dumbass guy who keeps changing your mind every two seconds. <laughs> What is a really famous line, and I'm not going to remember, but there's some line where I think it's like Mercutio and Romeo, and Romeo's like, Oh, I had a dream last night. And Mercutio's like, Oh, yeah, I had the did pixie too. dust or fairy dust, or green and, fairy. And Romeo's like, Oh, what did you dream? And basically, Mercutio's like, Oh, that like dreamers often lie. Uh, and it's kind of a like, Oh, Romeo being like, Oh, I had a dream. I'm such a dreamer. And Mercutio's like, Yeah, you're full of shit. You're it's pathetic. Really yeah. Funny. Romeo is <laughs> such a pathetic character in that opening part of the play he's literally like love with one girl one second and love with another girl the next second he's just like off in in, head in the clouds um and if we were to go with that meaning it's like she keeps saying you were romeo you were romeo yeah romeo Romeo is not someone you want (laughs) that's the wickham interpretation right there yeah yeah yeah, okay, I found the lines. I, I was pretty darn close, which is impressive. But Romeo, I dreamt a dream tonight. Mercutio, Mercutio. And so did I. Romeo, well, what was yours? Mercutio, that dreamers often lie. That's like a really great burn, actually. Yeah, I, <laughs> I love really Mercutio. Love I know. The oh. sidekicks in Shakespeare are the best. <laughs> Oh, yeah. the I think, isn't there a spinoff play about mercutio or oh, i think there's, I often, so. there's often a lot of spinoff plays too yeah um i don't know maybe not yeah my um, favorite spinoff play is off of hamlet i love rose yeah. and, and gildenstern are dead is just yeah fabulous yeah. um but anyways yeah i do think that like there is enough room for interpretation with some of these very loaded literary references uh to suggest that like yeah it is a love story like the one that we have all assumed all this time and what we see in the music video. I also think in that middle part that there is like a little bit of like, it could be more dramatic than we think 
uh, because there's just some extreme references. I think Scarlet Letter and then like the townspeople are gossiping. Like you really want to get away from this town um, and the never have to be alone. Like those are some, those are some devastating lines that makes you question just like, what exactly was this epic hurdle that you were going through? And I do think that if you're like looking back at your own love story or like you go back and you're like, all the challenges that we had to go through, like maybe there was something like really like devastating or like serious that you had to like overcome. Um, that could be, I, I think there could be a baby in there, but the notebook is also another great example. I feel like I think about that. When did the notebook come out? In they, are, they are still loaded. Like if Chris ever, 2004, if Chris yeah, ever somehow compared our love story to the scarlet letter i'd be like um babe excuse me no thank you what? <laughs> excuse yeah. me it's not like, that's, not that the, one. <laughs> that's not the novel i would have referenced yeah it's and like, the oh. fact that she wrote this in high school to me is like yeah. everybody did read these books everyone yes. did know what the book was about that's a exactly. loaded reference to throw in there when the entire book is about this pregnancy that and like sh- oh. deep shame I didn't read it, so I didn't know all that. I just knew it. it was a book, and it was about someone who was shamed and ostracized from society. So mm. thank you for yeah. enlightening me, Jen, Monty, <laughs> and Taylor. Yeah, it's definitely a loaded reference. Um, well, we're kind of getting there anyways, but do we want to each – Let's, let's do, the do it. What do, we, what do we think this, this story is? I, I can go first. I think Please. the most straightforward, it's so boring, but it's probably the best interpretation is that this is two people who are in love, who are older, and they are recounting their love story to one another. And that this yeah. was a, uh, it was a true love, a good love that worked out, but that they had their hurdles that they had to overcome together. So it's recounting, it's the end of the notebook when they're in the they're older and they're reading the story that he's i think noah's reading the story to Allie or you know whatever yeah. um but it's that it's that recounting to one another of oh we were young and here's our story but let's remember it um i think that there is potentially an interpretation and maybe this is just having been married longer now that i would see it this way and i would not have seen it as a teenager but um a potential uh, argument that they this is a couple who is encountering something difficult now in the present and they're recounting the story to say hey look what we overcame in the past mm-hmm. um, and because it ends with the you never have to be alone marry me it's a love story so it kind of ends in that moment of hope that could be reassuring themselves again as they're facing a new challenge i like that yeah, I think the interpretation is more fun, but whatever. <laughs> I also think the baby interpretation is really fun. And I do think that the evidence is there and there's nothing to really counteract it. But I, I, I think what I if I were to just take like one step back from that interpretation, also what I'm getting is that every couple goes through their own version of obstacles. And it could be anything like the ignominy or the shame. She could have been locked up because she was caught mingling with a lower class boy then that was extremely humiliating for her family this is the notebook plot or the titanic plot yeah. or um it could be something else it could be the fact that they had a moment in the garden and she got pregnant and was locked up but it could be a number of things but couples especially young couples um when you're young you feel like the world is against you and it could be some whatever the obstacle may have been Uh, It's also personal and it's private. And I like the fact that the song hints at something, but doesn't go into the detail and keeps you moving through time. Because when you look back at it all these years later, I feel like when my husband and I started dating, I think the Akon song, Nobody Want to See Us Together was like on the radio. And I think that was our song for like a hot moment. That's amazing. And I genuinely for the life of me cannot remember why, because I don't think we have had any kind of a dramatic love story. But like... In retrospect, you can gloss over it and look like go past it when you go back many, many years later. But you know that like in that moment, it felt like it was the world against you and you Mm. broke these big barriers to overcome something and you ended up here. And so I Mm. feel like I kind of like this idea that it takes you on this journey. It compares you to all the epic love stories. um, And it says ours is no different. Ours is right there with them. But we don't we don't need to share the details with everyone like, you know, you know what it is. I know what it is. We got through it. We're here. And yeah, 
I really like that you um, brought up class differences because I feel like that's something we briefly touched on in the last episode talking about West Side Story and how they changed us into like a gang war and we like understand that because that is something that's deep with this Romeo and Juliet comparison is they weren't allowed to be together because their families hated each other but we can think of many modern versions of that like that that was just not something we got into really in this conversation which I'm glad you brought that up because I think that would have been a missed opportunity of what is keeping them apart and we talk about scarlet letter and shame and all that but with romeo and juliet there's there are we i mean they seem to be not matter anymore but there are reasons that these families hate each other and yeah like class differences is a really obvious way for a modern interpretation or this i mean it could be racial differences could be something going on here as well we do get that in west side story um but that's that's interesting that it's not this thing that's keeping them apart it says daddy said stay away from Juliet, but we don't know what we we don't know why he's saying that and there could be something way deeper going on here there's definitely um, some sense of shame like i think that if scarlet letter in its most literal one is like oh like she has a baby but like in it le- in the more literary interpretation like let's extrapolate i think like she's been shamed for something and there could be so many reasons why yeah my purpose is a bit more simple and i think it just kind of goes back to this being written from taylor's person taylor writing this when she was in high school and i think this is the story you want your love story to tell like this is the story you want your love story to be the great loves romeo and juliet fairy tales like princess and princesses like you get to be together in the end this is when you are 15 16 years old what you think of when you think of your love story and it is one that yeah probably has some obstacles and people and your parents most notably trying to keep you apart but at the end of the day you get to be together because that is what a love story should be so i think that this is taylor just kind of really being young herself at this point in time and saying like however many years from now what would i want my love story to be what i want to say about my love story this is it and that's why I think it's, it would be really interesting to compare this to a song from Lover or Folklore or Evermore, one of her more recent albums, where she actually knows what love is. And I think we start to get some of it. They're like, yeah, she knew that there would be things that are difficult in a relationship, but she didn't know what. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to compare the two, her version of a love oh story God. from 15 and her version of a love story from you know, however old she is now. Taylor, the day you get married, we would like an updated version of the song. Love story. Please. <laughs> yes, please. Well, and I think too, like I totally see your point, but like we always talk about with metaphors of why that metaphor, like she could have used Snow White. She could have used Cinderella. She could have used these much more simple lighthearted stories. And she chose two references that are heavy, they're heavy, literary. They're literary. Heavy. Stories. Yeah, literary. They're, heavy. they're literary. They have obstacles. Um, they're not they are known but to your like yeah you're not reading this you're not reading romeo and juliet when you're five like that's not the fairy tale love that you're Mm -hmm. reading and and that's the thing it would have been so easy to do the fairy tales because everyone knows the fairy tales maybe is there some cliche with fairy fairy tales these feel more legitimate and heavy also like the two that are in here that are more like explicitly referenced but there's definitely a lot of pride and prejudice reference this like imagery especially with the outskirts to town scene and and the ball gown like the balls um and so it is interesting interesting of how she's just like up leveling it like let's make Mm -hmm. it a little bit more intelligent or a little bit more evergreen ap if you will a little more ap it's like she knew this podcast was coming and she needed to make sure (laughs) That it had enough literary. But, but it's what we said it. earlier, too. It's also putting herself in conversation with the greats. She's not yes. just any writer. She's she's not Shakespeare. She's Nathaniel Hawthorne. She's one of those. And, I, and to some of the death of the author stuff is like, we can discuss her intent. Sure, she was a teenager. But ultimately, the impact of these references are really heavy. Did she intend that or not? I don't know. But it doesn't ultimately matter for our experience and that we hear Scarlet Letter, we hear Romeo and Juliet. And if we know those stories, that that is a big difference than you were Cinderella. I was Cinderella. You were Prince Charming. Like the what, what she chose, regardless of intent, adds some layers of like, this is not a simple love story because she chose those references. We have to, it changes the way we hear it. 
All right. Well, that's a wrap. Join us next time on APTOS Swift.